after what seems to have been a month off, dang near a month, the Pick 6 podcast returns. Hello, everybody. I'm Sam McEwen, along with Evan Bland. Nothing has happened since we last spoke to you, which I do believe was a month ago. I think that's right. We were the two ships passing in the night, right? You were coming back from vacation. Yeah. I was heading out. We've had media days since then. It's been really, really hot. Yeah. We, we, we had a podcast on July 9th, actually. Day I got back from Cleveland. Yeah. But Trev Alberts had not been hired yet. And um, so much has happened since then. Texas and Oklahoma going to the big uh, to the SEC. Uh, so, so much has happened since then. Hello, everybody. As I said, Sam McEwen along with Evan Bland. We're Husker beat writers. You just never know with the Pick 6 Cobcast. We may get a visit from Dirk or Tom later, to, later in this podcast. We sort of keep it wide open uh, for them. Uh, we have plenty to talk about uh, here today, uh, including, um, well, shoot. Uh, we'll start, obviously, with Trev Alberts being hired and where Nebraska football is going. We're going to preview Nebraska's football camp, which starts in a couple of days. Um, and then uh, realignment talk is obviously a big deal. Um, that fired up last Wednesday. So we'll, we'll walk through a couple of those scenarios, things to think about. We'll uh, talk about a little bit about Nebraska baseball, doing quite to surviving the, the, the MLB draft quite well uh, and, and managing through that process quite beautifully and not losing very much, adding a few players on top of that. Uh, so we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about Husker basketball. They've had two media events, which we really appreciate over the last uh, week and a half. And in there, we got to learn a lot about new guys who are on the team and also some old vets that we've literally met in person for the first time. We had not met uh, Eduardo Andre in person. Uh, we had not met Lat Man in person. So uh, it's, it's a cool thing that, uh, that they're doing there. Um, so, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get rolling here and, and start where we need to start which is with Nebraska has a new athletic director. We don't need to recap the fact that he was hired at Nebraska, but I think we can start with Big Ten Media Days, his presence there, the things that he said about Nebraska's football program and athletic department, and how that dovetails with Scott Frost. Evan, your impressions of Trev Alberts, the first time you got to talk to him in Indianapolis, and your impressions of what he feels uh, are important in the athletic department and the football program. Yeah, it was it was fun to get to talk with Trev. I mean, I've I obviously followed his career at UNO, knew who he was. Uh, maybe you've said hello to him once or twice, but it was uh, I had a chance to talk to him to the side a little bit about Nebraska baseball and some other things. And you know, he just is a guy, even just in his first week, who strikes me as a guy who's going to be present. Um, you know, he, he drove up to Big Ten media days on his own. He didn't take the flight with Scott Frost and. Nebraska's representatives at Big Ten Media Days because those guys came in and they left on that same Thursday, whereas Alberts wanted to drive up, spend some extra time with folks in the Big Ten, his AD peers, whoever else, and really, you know, start to settle into his new surroundings. And I thought that was notable, first of all, but, you know, he, he's very, he's very well spoken. He's a guy who you know, you hear him say something and it's uh, it, it, you almost have to go back and listen or, or, or reread what he says to really get the full meaning of it sometimes. And I, I'd say that as a compliment because I think what he says is, is often very purposeful. Um, you know, he, he strikes me as a guy, the, the more I've spoken with him and the more I've looked at his resume, who's ideal for Nebraska in this time of this changing landscape in college athletics where you can't rely on what used to be and what has worked. You have to be proactive. You have to be innovative. He, you know, he showed that at UNO with how he transformed that athletic department into a division one program. And, you know, he told me to the side, he said, look, nobody cares how we did things six years ago. It's going to be all about what, what are we doing now? How are we moving forward in this era of NIL? How are we uh, as, as a conference, as a school adjusting to the reality of conference realignment? How are we being proactive in that. And so I think all those things will really serve 
Nebraska well, where, you know, Trev Alberts kind of is in that sweet spot, right, where he has uh, the experience at UNO, albeit at a smaller conference uh, as an AD, but he's also young enough, I think, to be uh, excited about what's to come and to be uh, not afraid to take some chances and have some different kinds of thinking with how they move forward. So I was really impressed with him. And uh, I know you were with him when he kind of gave his address on football. Um, and, and yeah, I, I was just I only had positive things to take away from that experience. Trev Alberts can say things that his predecessors could not. Um, that's the biggest takeaway that I have. And he can push for initiatives that his predecessors either would not or could not. That might be the most important thing about his hire. When he was able to say the words, first of all, nobody cares about what we've done. First of all, we can't worry about what we did six years ago, like he said to you. The previous athletic director would have had a hard time saying that. The one before him uh, might have said it, but people would have, you know, flipped out. And, you know, Trev Albert's former coach, Tom Osborne, was, was not going to say that, I think. And probably he shouldn't. You know, I mean, Osborne believes in a certain style and a certain approach and a certain system. And he wanted to bring a lot of those touches back. And not that those were bad things. I think the athletic department did fairly well under Osborne. But there is a certain reformer and reimagining energy to Alberts that would have been hard for some of his predecessors to embrace because they had not walked the journey he had walked as a Husker football player. The other thing is I think the fan base is now primed for some of these things. I think the pump wasn't primed in 2003 when they got rid of Frank Solich much too early. Trev Alberts agreed with that decision at the time. Incidentally, he said that on TV, but they got rid of him too early, a year too early. Um, and, and, and ultimately set in motion some very divisive and hurtful and painful things that, that came to pass in the years after that. Um, so that wasn't the time, you're right. You know, so the reformer thing wasn't, wasn't quite right at that moment. Um, but I think we're now four losing football seasons in, four in a row uh, into recognizing and five out of the last six of recognizing, man, so, something here needs to be updated and Nebraska's approach, whether it is the approach from 1989 or the approach from 2015 under Sean Eichhorst just isn't all that. And there needs to be something to change. And so Albert's going to Big Ten Media Days, being present there, saying some of the things that he said, not only that, hey, we're not going to talk about wins and losses, which was a very clear comment to Bill Moose. Um, and then we're also not going to talk, we're not going to get caught in the past. We're going to go forward and we're going to de do what we need to do uh, moving forward. And he, he kind of addressed that at the sellout streak. And I wrote last week that I feel like the sellout streak has been propped up, uh, that it is at this point somewhat artificial, and that when you look uh, at the empty seats at Memorial Stadium, um, you know <laughs> that that sellout streak is being, you know, sort of propped up by people who want to keep it alive because they don't want to hurt the coaching question or whatever's going on there. Um, and I know there was a story the AP wrote five years ago or so where they basically said that was what was happening. But you can look at the empty seats and the gate receipts at the attendance and know that Nebraska's appropriate um, stadium size in this moment of man caves and of super duper, um, you know, home setups where you get the beer and you get the great Wi-Fi and don't discount the great Wi-Fi. You get the beer, you get the Wi-Fi, you get the bathroom that's four feet away, you get your friends and you get four other games on your TV because you've got five TVs set up downstairs. Nebraska has to provide a premium experience for its fans in the stadium. And there might be about 65 to 70,000 fans for that. Not 90, not 85, not even 78. Um, you have to start to create a premium, cool experience in the stadium that not only combines the energy that you get there because you're around 65,000 other people, but has some of the amenities 
um, that you would already have. And so I think Alberts is able to speak into that in a way where maybe they can't fix that right away. Maybe that's not something they can address right off the jump, but it's clearly in the back of their mind, right? So there's a larger vision there. The other thing that I thought was striking is just the way that he talked about his relationship with Scott Frost. And then when I asked Scott about, were there things on your plate that you wish had not been, um, his answer to that. And Frost's answer to the question is, there's a thousand things that I've done that where I wish I could have been doing something else. Um, now, of course, he's exaggerating a little bit in the number, but I don't doubt that there's been things that Scott Frost has been asked to to do or to oversee because there's just not that much of an apparatus that was doing that for him. And I think there were people who were afraid to say hard things to him. I think there were people who were afraid to say, maybe there's a better way and a more efficient way where you don't have to put in this much labor intensive, in, intensity to get this done. And the guy that was really supposed to be able to do that, Bill Moose, was as hands-off an athletic director as you will ever find. And I think most coaches appreciate that, right? They want uh, ADs that, that don't meddle, but I'm not even sure I would call what Bill Moose was doing not meddling. I would say that it was, if, if you go into deep water that you've never been in, deep administrative water that you didn't have to deal with at UCF because it was a smaller school and you didn't have to deal with at Oregon because you weren't the head coach, swim. <laughs> like there was a, there was a quality there of like <laughs> well it's your program <laughs> and i don't think that's going to be albert's approach i i think on some level frost was still a new coach he's you know i mean he's not he's not perfect he's a human and i think there would there could have been a few more uh guardrails and a few well, not guardrails but just structure to say hey you're in the Big Ten. You're at Nebraska. You don't have to do this. We've got people over here who can do this for you. Or, hey, you're in the Big Ten. You're in a huge media market. Is this, this really the way you want to handle the Maurice Washington situation? Because you don't have to handle it like this. And guess what? Your program's not going to make or break with number 28. So why don't, why don't you think about this process a little bit so that, hey, you're going to be here a long time. You need to not act as if, you know, and I'm not saying they died on the hill with Maurice Washington, but man, that, that whole saga set the program back a few months. I thought, you know, and they dragged that situation into the 2019 season and the guy never talked to the media and Scott's having to give, you know, monthly updates and we're writing stuff about him in court. And, and I'm like, there's gotta be an easier way. And I, I just felt like Frost didn't get a ton of help on that team. And maybe he rebuffed it, but I also didn't think he got a lot of help. So I think Albert's approach in this process will be, um, when he said, I'm going to hold him accountable and he's going to hold me accountable, I don't know that that was a kind of relationship that he had with, uh, with Moose. And the other thing I would say about Frost, and this is misunderstood about him, there, there are people out there now who are Frost critics. Scott Frost is not opposed to disagreement or to creative tension. He's not opposed to that. You can ask him hard questions. You can challenge him a little bit. Um, whereas Bo Pelini was more, you know, if you, what, or well, more Carl, don't, don't question me. <laughs> I'm right. You know, that kind of thing. And, and I think Scott's got a little bit more capacity to have a give and take relationship with an AD than people think. And, mm -hmm. and so I think that could end up being a really good relationship between the two of them. They're both very smart. Their personalities are different. Uh, Trev can talk his talk, talk through any situation. Uh, Scott prefers to talk a little less. Um, but I feel like the marriage could work. Uh, that, that was the sense that I got coming out of Big Ten Media Days, that these are not two guys that are necessarily going in opposite directions. Yeah, I agree. And and it, again, you mentioned Albert's Nebraska background that automatically buys him some credibility with Frost as well. And, you know, I think one of the, the big questions from the Alberts hire was, OK, how does this help Nebraska football? And I think it's exactly what you're saying, where it's some of the the peripheral stuff. It's some of the, 
the the administrative stuff, the things to the side where, you know, Scott Frost knows why Nebraska football hasn't been winning games, whether that's the chronic mistakes, the penalties, the turnovers, things that everyone's familiar with. Trev Alberts isn't going to, you know, break any news or shed any new light in that regard. It is, I think, more like you said, more of an, of an assist to a, a, a new coach, a coach who's, who's only been a head man for, what, five years now, six years from, from mm-hmm. his UCF days, um, who's, who's still in some ways adjusting to a new league. And, yeah, I, I think all the, the off-field stuff and, and how that fleshes out this season and, and potentially beyond will be really fascinating to see. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I'm curious to um, to find out if they try to push anything early in terms of initiatives. Again, Trev Alberts has the reputation of an idea man. Um, he was able to extract more money out of boosters for UNO athletics than anybody thought was imaginable. Yeah. Um, their baseball. Have you seen their baseball stadium, by the way? Yeah, it's gorgeous. Baseball it's softball, nice, man. Baseball. Like it's it's a nice place to go watch a baseball game. It's it's perfect for them. You know, it's it's not obviously Haymarket Park, but it's certainly better than Creighton's. Well, Creighton doesn't really play at its own facility. They play at TD Ameritrade, but TD Ameritrade's too big for Creighton. I mean, it, oh, it yeah. doesn't have the ambiance that Creighton needs, in my opinion. Um, but the UNO's Park is perfect for UNO. Um, obviously, Baxter is a is a high level hockey arena seems big for hoops, but they make it work. Um, they've, they've transformed that campus. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've had family that have gone to UNO uh, Omaha in the last, I don't know, decade or so. I, I, and the vibe around that campus um, in the last decade compared to maybe two decades ago is just a whole different thing. Um, you go there and it's, and it's a, it's a, it's a, a different experience um, it's a university experience. It doesn't feel commutery. And I think Trev has a lot to do with that. You know, obviously uh, his, the chancellor who hired him, John Christensen, deserves some credit too, as do businessmen in the community. But I think you could say that, that in a lot of ways, Albert's moving it to division one, giving it a little bit of a, giving a little bit of a spruce up in terms of its reputation, and then being able to build these anchor style facilities it can then connect Baxter Arena to the Dodge campus. And then everything from there to there is kind of UNO. And then you've got Exarbin right there. And you know what? It's a pretty cool part of town. Like it's, it's, it works. It works for UNO. And I will be curious to see, um, you know, when you go out on the sixth floor of, of uh, Memorial Stadium, that's where the press conference for Scott Frost will be tomorrow. And you can walk over to one of those windows, and from that window, you can see Haymarket Park, right, which is across the interstate, across I-180, and also across I-180 is Pinnacle Bank Arena. And they form kind of a triangle, right? Mm-hmm. And then you can kind of walk over to the other side, to the press box side, and look out the other way, and what do you see? You see Devaney, you see um, where, the, where the new facility is going to be built, and it's in that sort of line with a triangle at the end, that's sort of the Nebraska athletics, what do you want to call it, corridor? Yeah. Right? I'm curious to see how he reshapes that corridor. I'm not saying you're talking about <laughs> connective pieces that, that, that arch across I-180. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm saying how do you kind of redefine or maybe rebrand some of that so that it feels a little bit more cohesive and a little less like, we have all of these buildings, which, by the way, all have different architecture. They're all different. Like Devaney is nothing like PBA, which is nothing like Haymarket, which is nothing like Memorial Stadium. Like, how do you begin to create an identity out of that um, where it doesn't feel like you have, well, that sports in this silo and that sports in this silo. And it, it starts to feel more cohesive and uniform and does anything change about the new football building now that he's there because um, I know that Bill Moose had really looked forward to um, being able to kind of add a bell or a whistle to that building he loves that stuff and he didn't get that opportunity that's why I don't think he was ready to retire retire I, I, I just I don't I don't know that that was necessarily what he had planned I think he would have liked to have stayed through this season and seen the beginning processes of that building 
um, but he didn't get that chance. They, they wanted him to go at a $3 million price ticket, um, which is a lot, but I'll be curious to see how that vision, how over time Alberts is able to shape that vision specifically in Memorial stadium. Um, you've been to game, you've been every game the last five years, right? Five. Except for the Rutgers road game last year. Yeah. Every home game is what I meant. Um, it's too big. Uh, it, it's a beautiful place. The fans make it special and you've got one side of that stadium that is just, it no longer is what it could be. That needs to be taken shortened way down, put a walkway pavilion around the top of it. See back in the end zone. Need some Western students media. out of there. <laughs> Move your students somewhere else. Yep. Um, then get a walkway, a pavilion around that. Give your students a plaza where if they're over 21, they can have a beer for goodness sakes. And Trev Alberts can get beer in there. You know, he can go to Coach Osborne and say, hey, this is, it's time. <laughs> that would be a conversation I'd love to hear. Well, there's studies that show that it, it, it reduces binge strength, that kind of stuff. Sure. It does because you don't, you don't, you don't, you're not trying to, you're not trying to fit them all in in the parking lot you're you know you're willing to go in and go into the stadium and maybe try something softer and you know maybe it's a beer instead of you know at, at a cold game you know in in november you know trying to trying to hit as many shots as you can to warm yourself up oh, before yeah. you go in. people sneaking in flasks sure well, yeah absolutely now if you go in there and you can get a beer maybe if, maybe you're not doing that thing you know, because um, I, I think I think there's arguments that by having alcohol on the premises, you actually reduce the number of poor behavior. Now, in the NFL, it's different. But NFL fans are different than college fans. They really are. Uh, people who have been to NFL games know that the level of whatever you want to call it, in, uh, intensity and whatever in the stands is different. I mean, it's a war. It's I kind of love it, but I, other people find it intimidating and strange. Let's move to Nebraska's football fall camp here. Uh, we call it fall camp, but it's training camp. It's going to be 100 friggin' degrees on Friday, so uh, it won't feel like fall. It's training camp. Um, they're starting a week early because uh, they have a week zero game. Uh, Scott Frost seemed really ready to get this camp going. I'm ready to get this camp going. I think you are too. Yes. And at the same time, as we walk into this camp, I think to myself – what are the three or four things that I can actually say I don't know about this team? And what what is and and of those three or four things, what difference do they make to the season at hand? Mm -hmm. Because the biggest thing that Nebraska struggled with is self-discipline issues that we all know about turnovers, penalties, um. I don't know. Tactical missteps. Yeah. Sure. Uh, screwing around with special teams, people not knowing what's going on, the wrong kicks in the wrong places. I mean, things that shouldn't happen. But right. those aren't things that can get res those are the kind of things that you can talk about all camp long, but the proving ground is the season. But it feels like there's three or four things that you can actually address and resolve in spring camp or in training camp. And I'm curious as to how much impact, for example, the running back battle is going to have on the season. Because if you're asking me, well, what position is going to be the most interesting going into training camp? That's the one. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I'm writing a five position battles thing. It was kind of hard to come up with five because everything's so set at, at so many positions for Nebraska. But yeah, the, the running back thing is clearly the, the, the headliner for this fall. I mean, what's the status of Marquis step? What, uh, you know, can, can Gabe Irvin build off of what he did in the spring? Jacquez Yant, uh, you know, the Yantinator or whatever they called him. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. I like that one better. That seems a little more natural, but yeah. Okay, what's his role going to be? Uh, you know, Sivian Morrison, does he take that next step? Like they're, they have a lot of guys, a lot of possibilities and they're all kind of a little bit different. They all, they all kind of have their own uh, unique running styles. I'm, I've been a, a Gabe Irvin guy since he came on. I think he's might be the most well-rounded player and, and you look around college football and you see 
uh, every year there are going to be freshmen running backs that pop and and you know that's one of those positions that you can come in right away and make a difference in so uh you know is he that guy does step become the guy that they think he could be um and then you know it, it's so it's such a, a nuanced issue right because it's not just how do those guys do it's how do those guys do behind this offensive line that Nebraska and Scott Frost feel like might be their biggest strength on that side of the ball. How do they do, um, you know, working with Adrian Martinez, who's in his fourth year and still trying to kind of iron out some of those decisions that have, have uh, you know, caused him some missteps over the, the course of his career. So like, yeah, I mean, it, the running back spot's really fascinating. It's been one that Nebraska, I don't know, that, Devina Zigbo, Diedrich Mills have been serviceable in that role when they've been healthy, but they really haven't had that guy, that guy since Amir Abdullah, you know, five, six years ago. Oh, yeah. So it's just like that, that's been a piece that's been missing from this offense. Um, and, and you're reminded of it every week when Nebraska's playing Jonathan Taylor, or when they're playing, uh, you know, whoever else has a dynamic running back. And, and you just feel like, man, that, that could be the piece or one of the pieces that's been missing from this offense. So, yeah, I mean, you can go down the list and say, Oh, who's the next, who's, who's going to fill in as the, as DiCaprio Boodle's replacement at corner, who's going to be that right guard. Um, you know, what's the inside linebacker rotation look like? Really? It comes down to running back as far as position battles of interest this fall that maybe could impact wins and losses and maybe how we view this season at the end. I will add kickoff specialist. Mm -hmm. um, I think they have, Connor Culp is the incumbent. Um, I don't, Culp was not good at that role last year. And let's just call it what it is. He had 12 touchbacks. You ideally don't want 12. You want your percentage to be higher than that. Mm -hmm. So they brought in three guys. Um, Kellen Meyer, uh, Brendan Frankie, and Josh. I think I've had this last name right. Jasic, Jasic from Iowa Western. And I think the Iowa Western guy is probably more likely to be a place kicker contender next season after Culp, but I'm sure he'll be given an opportunity to kick some kickoffs too. And they, they would love to find somebody who can kick it through the end zone. Mm -hmm. And the one, th the one reason you want to have that skill is a couple times a year. Like when you play Aaron Crookshank or you play Iowa's kickoff returner from a couple of years ago, Amir Smith Marset, you want to have a kicker who has the ability to kick it through the end zone. And yeah, it's not ideal because the, the opponent starts at the 25, but that's better than them scoring a touchdown. And that's happened three times. Uh, gosh, darn in the last 11 games, 11, they played eight last year and uh, it, they happened against Wisconsin and Iowa the year before the last 11 games, they've given up three kickoff returns for touchdowns. And that's not good. That's the opposite of good. Uh, so that's the other one that I guess I'm looking at. Um, when you, when you examine uh, the defensive side of the ball, Evan, it seems so uh, set in so many different ways. Your defensive line rotation seems pretty tight, barring injuries. We're looking at uh, Ben Stilley, Ty Robinson, Damian Daniels, Casey Rogers, Jordan Riley, DeAndre Thomas, and a seventh, which is probably Colton Feast. Could be Nash Hutmaker, could be Mosai Newsom. But I think we have we feel pretty good about the top six at inside linebacker. We know the three rotating almost certainly will be Luke Reimer, Nick Henrich and Chris, Chris Kalarvik. Uh, I think Henrich might be the best of the three even this year. We'll see. Outside linebacker. I think we know that one, too. Jojo Doman, Caleb Tanner, Phil Darius Payne, whoever backs up Jojo Doman and Garrett Nelson. <laughs> And I think Isaac Gifford's going to win that 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 sort of uh, that other job uh, behind Doman. We'll see. Um, but the four that I just rattle off: Nelson, Doman, Payne, Tanner. That's probably your four. You know who your starting safeties are, and the guy that might rotate in first, which is Miles Farmer. You know who one of your corners is, and Cam Taylor Britt. And on the other side is probably Quentin Newsom. Probably Quentin Newsom. Braxton Clark. They, maybe. they signed Tyreek Johnson for a reason. And they did not sign him to come here and, and you know, not do, not compete. <laughs> they brought him here for a reason. And, uh, yeah, you only got Cam Taylor Britt for one more year. So 
you, you, you can feel confident that, that you're going to have to find some other players who can play starting next year. And Johnson will probably be more in line for a starting job next season. But, uh, but yeah, they brought him here to compete right away. And we know so much about that side of the ball. I mean, I think we just, we just rattle off the 11 starters. Uh, and it. many of their backups. <laughs> right. Well, that's the, that's what's so fascinating with the COVID year is everyone had this chance to come back and, you know, we saw it in the spring because that was the first sport to kind of go through that second round of things with a lot. I mean, it was, it was really high quality spring, watching a lot of baseball games, seeing guys come back, you know, playing the game at 22, 23, sometimes 24 years old. And, you know, I think it served a lot of teams well, and it served the sport well for a really high quality season. I think we're going to see that in football too. I mean, just think like if, if the pandemic hadn't occurred, you're talking a, a totally, you know, just by the, the natural order of things, it would have been a totally new uh, secondary, maybe Cam Taylor Britt would have come back. Uh, it, it just would have changed a lot. The, the linebacking situation, Jojo Doman would have been gone. So it's, it's a defense that by all rights should, should be turning over and looking a lot different this year. Instead uh, with all the messiness of, of last year behind them, it's, it's setting up to be a year where, it's such a known quantity, probably about as known a quantity as Nebraska's ever had on that side of the ball. And I'll still maintain that to me, the most interesting thing, and we won't know it until the season, is can they take that next step from getting three and outs and forcing punts to getting those turnovers? Because right. that's really, that's always been the identity, uh, what they wanted it to be uh, under Frost and Shenander is for the defense to be that complimentary piece getting it back. And so it just feels like if that's ever going to happen, this would be the time when you start when those pass deflections turn into interceptions and those, uh, you know, those tackles at the line turn into fumbles. Um, you know, these guys have been in the system for a long time. They're playing because they've, they've earned the spots and they're talented enough to do it. Uh, it's just going to be really fascinating to me. It feels like this is a year where you can really identify whether that strategy uh, for what they envision as the defense of, of forcing turnovers and, and negative yardage and complementing the offense. If that's ever going to work, it feels like this is the year it has to work. Hmm. On offense, and we'll delve more into the offense next week. Um, again, I, I, it's not that we, I couldn't do a 30 minutes on the defense. I certainly could talk about a lot of different things there, but I feel like there's, there's a clear identity there, and they're either going to get better or they're not, just like you said. Offensively, we'll delve more into it next week. Off, off the blush, um, really appreciated Austin Allen's comments in Big Ten and in Indianapolis. Uh, clearly, the offense um, that Scott Frost had at, at Central Florida can work in the Big Ten, but maybe not at, at quite the full octane as it was working at UCF. And part of that is because Big Ten defenses, A, are just better, and B, they have really good coaches who can scout Nebraska's 2018 season in the Big Ten and make adjustments, which they did. And so some of the things that Nebraska was able to do in 2018 um, – they weren't able to do in 2019 and 2020. So Nebraska's got to sort of tack back just like you would in a big sailing race in the middle of the ocean. It's about stealing each other's win. And you have to, you have to figure out a way to get the win back. And Alan was talking about, you know, trying to tweak a few things here or there, uh, get getting the tight ends even more involved than they were last season. Um, allowing Nebraska's athletes that are long and tall to, to rise up and make plays. And then there, there appears to be um, a more of an identity running the football. In other words, let's get, let's get three or four or five runs that we're good at, and then let's play action off of those. And hopefully there's enough help for Adrian Martinez as a quarterback to, to be able to grow. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's, it's what we often talk about. Like, can they find an identity this year? And that conversation has been muddled these last couple of years by this idea that like, is the scheme sound, but the talent not sound. Um, and, and so it feels like for the first time that that the talent piece is more or less set. So you can have that conversation about play calling. You can have that conversation about the flow of an offense. So like, you know, the, the old line is young, but like, it's pretty talented. You look across the line there and, and those are guys uh, you feel pretty good about. And they have some depth there too. I mean, Brant Banks is a guy coaches have talked about 
Uh, Nuri Noelli is another guy. Uh, th these guys probably won't start, but they've earned a lot of confidence as backups. Um, the running back battle we've kind of laid out there. The receivers, to me, are really interesting because <laughs> Nebraska returns virtually no production from that position. But what, you know, you talk to Scott Frost, you talk to people, um, you know, the players and such, like Samari Torre made an impact in the spring. Um, Oliver Martin, you, you saw him, some of his testing numbers in the off season and what his recruiting pedigree was out of high school. Yeah, he's transferred twice in his college career, but that's a guy who you could see stepping in. You know, Xavier Betts, who's, uh, you know, as physically gifted as anybody is. How much has he learned the offense and come along? Uh, you can just kind of go down the line where, uh, and, and, you know, it, it's tough this time of year because you can kind of talk yourself into it a little bit, but it, it feels like the pieces are there for the offense to do something. Um, I don't know. It, it comes down to, to play calling. Can Adrian Martinez hit the throws? Can they make the right reads, um, you know, pre-snap and post-snap? Uh, but but it, to me, it just feels like the talent piece, at least for this year, is kind of settled more than it has been. So, again, you can have those conversations about, you know, uh, on-field reading mistakes or, or play calls because the, the guys are there to make the plays, it feels like to me. Do you agree? Well, we'll see. You know, I, I, here's what I would say, Evan, is that I'll be curious to know what the gap is between the most talented players on the team and the, most, and, the, and the players on the team who are most competent in understanding the offense. Last year, yeah. I feel like there was a gap between those two things, and it was expressed in a midseason shift in philosophy um, by the offensive coordinator, Mac Lubick and Frost in choosing to put walk on wide receivers on the field who would do what they were supposed to do. Bottom line, block, run the right routes, be where Adrian wanted them to be, be where Adrian expected them to be. I think those are big pieces of the puzzle. People have been very critical of Martinez in saying he doesn't know how to read a defense or he stares a guy too long. These are things that I see on, 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 you know, on Twitter. My response would be, okay, I mean, that, that's possible. Yes. I mean, I'm not going to discount it. But are the players where they're supposed to be all the time? And is he getting the picture that he anticipated getting before the snap? There are times in his career, Purdue in 2019, when he threw that wheel route to JD that wasn't open, uh, the, 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 the bizarre play at Northwestern where he's scrambling and probably could have run for 10 yards and decides to do some sort of, you know, 500 ball to the end zone and it's intercepted. There have been times when Martinez certainly is, is to blame for some of the mistakes that he's made. Um, but there's also been, I think, times when he's taken sacks or he's had to scramble when the picture just hasn't been very good and he hasn't been, he has not gotten what he anticipated getting from the players around him. And that piece has to improve. And I think where they got to last year was, well, one thing that's going to happen is Adrian might not be throwing to the fastest guys, but he's damn sure throwing to guys now who are going to be where we say they're going to be. And that's, that'll be the thing that I'm watching. In, 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 I think the thing that they really like about Samari Touré, and I asked, I can't remember. Oh, it was Deontay Williams, actually. I was asking him who's the best receiver on the team. I asked him who had the most potential, and he said Xavier Betts. I said, who's the best? And he said Touré. And, and, and here's what Deontay said, and it, it, it's, it's a smart thought, and it tells you how much Deontay understands football. He said, Samari knows what he's good at, and he knows how to get open. And I think Touré's addition – and his mastery of the offense, and the fact that he comes in relatively egoless. A lot of these FCS guys, when they come up to this level, they know they have something to prove, and they're not coming into that. They're not coming into the program thinking that they're going to be the savior. And so they know what they already know, and they are determined to prove they belong. And so I think Ture really went about his business in the spring, and he became one of Martina's favorite targets. And one of the last things Martina said in the spring uh, before he didn't talk again was he said, you know, Ture is consistent. And that's good. That's the key is that can these super talented players like Omar Manning and Betts and others, can they be where they're supposed to be so that the quarterback 
knows where the hell he's going to throw the ball. And I'm probably a bigger defender of Martinez than most, but I think part of the issue has been that the people around him, well, it ain't Alabama. Let's put it that way. Right. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. There's my thought on your question. I think you make a good point, um, but I want to see if the best, the most talented players on the team are now players who the coaching staff agrees are among the most competent in understanding the offense. Um, let's talk about realignment. That was a bombshell that landed last week. I didn't, I didn't expect it. We were getting on a plane to go to Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's it pops on, on Twitter with some national reports. And I mean, in that moment, I thought it felt fluid enough that like, by the time we landed and got Wi-Fi back, like the big 12 could be disbanded as quickly as it felt like move, things were moving last Wednesday. Don't you think? Yeah. Well, effectively it is now. I mean, The move has been made. Now, now we see if any of the other conferences feel compelled to do anything in response. The, the leagues to watch. But first, let's 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 reel this back really quickly. I want to give thirty seconds to forty-five seconds on this. This is why Nebraska left the Big Twelve for the Big Ten. Um, Texas and Oklahoma were no longer excited or interested in their marriage. Here are my here is my uh, two cent uh, you know sports psychologist thought on this. Oklahoma had done everything it could in the Big Twelve, everything it had won six Big Twelve titles in a row, and unlike Clemson, who could win all those ACC titles against what I consider to be lesser competition, and nevertheless go to the national championship and win a couple of them, Oklahoma did not. Oklahoma was not benefiting from the competition in its own league. It was not benefiting from playing nine conference games against teams that it almost always beat. There was not a single week. Think about this for a second, Evan. There was not a single week in the last six years where Oklahoma football was not favored um, from a perception standpoint. Now, did they have a couple games where they are underdogs? Yes, they did. They did. I think they were underdog maybe to Texas once, maybe Baylor. I don't know. But the bottom line is every single time Oklahoma lined up on a football field in the Big 12, it expected to win. And there's only one other pro there's only two other programs in the college football that you can really say that about. And that's Alabama and Clemson. And the, the difference between Alabama and Clemson and Oklahoma is that Alabama and Clemson were winning national titles and Oklahoma wasn't. So there was literally nothing else Oklahoma could do in the league that it was in other than keep winning it and hopefully play so well that it, it eventually kicked over into a natty. Texas, meanwhile, was not that program. Uh, they, I think they were the third or fourth best program, honestly, over the last six years in the, big, in the Big 12. But it's one thing to get your ass kicked by Iowa State or by Kansas State and have that only diminish your brand. And it's another to go to the SEC and have you get your Bevo kicked by Auburn or Alabama and have it not really hurt your brand that much. The other thing that I think had happened is that Texas was no longer able to get some of the best players in its own state because Texas A&M and LSU and, and Alabama were coming in and taking the players and saying, SEC, do you really want to go to the Big 12 or the SEC? And so I think there were reasons why they moved and Nebraska was wise to get out of the Big 10 when it, Big 12 when it did because Texas and Oklahoma were always going to have those ambitions they were oh they were always willing to leave behind their peers because they looked down on their peers and i think they looked down on nebraska too now back to the to the to the question at hand and i'm curious what your thought process is on this the sec has taken texas and oklahoma there are now eight teams left in the big 12 the big 12 can either add teams or the big 12 can have a holding pattern and it can, and the Big 12 is not Bob Bowlesby. He obviously knows nothing about what's going on because, you know, the, his top two products were swiped underneath his nose. The Big 12, the members can either say, hey, let's keep this thing together and be a slightly better Mountain West. Or they can wait like ingenues for somebody to come and pick them up and whisk them away to another league. Here's my question to you. 
Do you think the Big Ten, the ACC, or the Pac-12 budge? Yeah, it, I mean, I think so. I, I don't think the the leftover eight in the Big Twelve can stand pat. You know, and what what made me think that not their was, choice to stand pat though. The other leagues got to want them. Do they want them? Ah, uh, no. I don't know that they do. I don't know that they do. I think that the Big Ten has made it clear that it prioritizes schools that are members of the Association of American Universities, and there aren't a lot of those. I don't, I don't believe many at all, if any, in the Big 12 right now. I don't think Kansas or Kansas State are. I don't think uh, um, Iowa State is. So, you know, there was talk about Kansas uh, in terms of adding what it has from the basketball side of things. I don't, I don't think that the big that moves the needle for the Big Ten, which uh, you know has brought in some crummy football programs the last handful of years. I don't think it wants to do that again. It's pretty happy with with fourteen. You know, the Pac twelve. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Does it make any sense at all to add Iowa State to the Pac twelve or to add uh, the Kansas school? I, I don't think so. They're not in a position to necessarily expand either. Um, you know, the ACC maybe I, I i don't know I, I think if you're the leftover eight right now you're you're feeling pretty pretty on, on pretty shaky ground with, with where you stand right like do you end up in the mountain west do you end up uh in the aac like it just feels like the other the other conferences probably aren't all that inclined to add on and if you're the big 10 or the pac 12 and you see the move that the acc just made or is making with Oklahoma and Texas, what possible counter move can you do? Can you make that would keep up with that? You know, it, it, Iowa State, Kansas. If you're the Big Ten, meh. Notre Dame, they're they're not they're not giving up their independence. That would be a big one, but they're not moving. So, I, I don't see what kind of counter move you can make. Now, maybe there's as as we've heard uh, rumors among the Pac-12 and the Big Ten that they form some kind of partnership where they play each other more. Um, you know, maybe in a, in a uh, crazy future scenario, they would merge into some kind of super league down the, <laughs> into the future at some point. But no, it I doesn't feel to me like these leagues are jumping to add Iowa State and Kansas State and Oklahoma State and whoever else might be left. At the moment, I'm with you. What could change? Yeah. Um. You know, Kansas showing definitive improvement in football. Um, I mean, Kansas football is not just, you know, below average. It's, it's a joke. Yeah. And, and has, has, has repeatedly made mistakes as it's, in, its, in its coaching hires. It hired not one, but two sort of aging big names, neither of whom were, were, were up to the task. They just weren't up to, I know what, Les Miles got fired in part because of things he did at LSU before he left there, right. but they were awful last year, awful. And I don't think that was going to resolve itself um, at all. Uh, and then of course they hired Charlie Weiss, who, you know, had rumored of falling asleep and, practice it <laughs> it doesn't matter now um i don't know if that's true that's just something i heard you know I, I don't of all the football programs that would be left in the big in the big 12 in my opinion kansas state is the best property of the eight uh you can't count on baylor and i oklahoma state deep down is about a lot of other things other than football as well. They've Oklahoma state's been a better program than K state, but Okie state's got a lot of divided. I mean, they're wrestling and baseball and basketball. And you could say that all four of those are on very similar levels in terms of perception within their own fan base at Kansas state. It's football. Now Bill Snyder has altered that conversation. The problem with K state is they're not in the AAU and um, you know, the Big Ten wouldn't dare, whatever you want to call it, stoop to that. And then on the other side, I think Syracuse is a legitimate 
I think you can take Syracuse from the ACC. I think Syracuse would do it. Um, I think they'd be willing to do it. Uh, and I think Syracuse football can be very good. It's been very good in the past and uh, has great history. Nearly won a national championship a couple of times. You know, if they beat Miami one year, they're in the national title game. They fall a couple of yards short. I think that's when Marvin Graves was there. And then um, they had an undefeated season uh, in, in, I think, 87. Yeah. And they just, they were third or fourth behind OU and Miami that year. So they didn't get in the title, but they've had a great, I mean, Syracuse is a legitimate football program. And if you added them, uh, well, first of all, you'd be crapping on Rutgers and Maryland pretty good, but that'd be a, that'd be a good addition. I just don't. And then Notre Dame, I mean, yeah, Notre Dame wants to join. Great. They're not, not good. If they want to. No, not yet. Not yet. There may come a point where it's like where it becomes obvious they're going to have to join a league and they're going to have to ask themselves, do we really, really want to thumb our noses at the Big Ten? Do we really want to cut off our nose to spite our face because we've got eyes for the ACC and we have to really ask ourselves why? And I don't know that their leadership has ever been able to be able to say, We'd rather caucus with, you know, North Carolina and Virginia and these other schools instead of Michigan and Ohio State. And oh, by the way, keep us in your hockey league, though. <laughs> it's, there'll come a point where I think big, where Notre Dame has to ask an existential question of like, um, you know, if we have to join a league, are we, are we saying no to the Big Ten because of some weird uh -uh kind of reason that doesn't, that doesn't comport with rationality, but we'll see. Baseball, let's do it quick. Rob Childress in the program. Um, there are advantages to that. There could be disadvantages too. Um, I'll mention the disadvantage. When you have a, when you have a more accomplished head coach in your dugout than than any of the other people there, you have to be wise about how he's deployed, right? To a two point, I mean, he's director of player development, so he's not an on field coach. So, like when he was the head coach at A and M, and Jeff Christie, who is now Nebraska's pitching coach, was his volunteer assistant, he filled in a couple times, calling pitches in games when Childress was out. But I think just by the nature of their roles, I don't, I don't see that being a huge issue during the season. And I asked him about it too. I said, you know, how strange is it hiring your old boss to work for you? And Will Bolt, Rob Childress, everybody kind of echoed the same thing, which was they kind of ignored titles anyway and, were, and worked collaboratively. So yeah, I, I think there are situations and certain people that if you were to put them in a position like this, it would be awkward and it could get dysfunctional. But I think just the fact that Will Bolt made the hire and wanted to make the hire to me signals that he's comfortable with it. And as, as Trev Alberts put it, when I asked him about the program, he said, I appreciated Will's showing personal, his personal security as a coach. You know, he knew who he was as a coach and was comfortable enough to make the hire of his mentor and the guy that also coached him when he was a player at Nebraska for the sake of the program. So I, I'm personally not worried about it and, and just, you know, knowing a, a lot of those guys, like they're, they're not outwardly, um, there, there's not a lot of ego there, I guess. And so I think when, when they all kind of share uh, uh, a love for the greater goal where they want to win, they want to do it at Nebraska, um, it just, it doesn't strike me as something that's going to be a huge problem. And uh, you know, it, Childress is in his mid fifties. He's been a, a head coach at a major program for 16 years. I think at some point, everybody kind of gets to this point too, where they're like, man, I've done, I've been the guy for a long time. And it's kind of fun to be maybe in more of a support role and use all that experience to help empower other people. And to me, that's one of the big, you know, markers of culture. So like <laughs> my, my analogy as a San Antonio Spurs fan was, when, when David Robinson gave up kind of the superstar status to Tim Duncan, like not everybody did that. That was unusual in the NBA because usually those superstars want to be the guy all the way to the end. 
But when you can have that kind of a transition, man, you can set up something really special. And this kind of reminded me of that a little bit where Rob Childers could have taken a head coaching job somewhere else. He could have gotten out of the, out of the business this year, but like, I think there's a certain level of humility or servant leadership that, that shows up in a hire like Nebraska made that uh, to me just signals like, the culture is strong. And we talk about culture all the time in football and maybe what's right, and what's wrong about it. This to me is an example of what's working well on the baseball side of things. Okay. They added pitchers. <laughs> One from yeah. AM. Who you talked to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was interesting. Um, he didn't want to leave there, didn't like the new coach. Yep. What else did they add? They added uh, Dawson McCarville, who was a, a right-hander. He's a essentially a grad transfer from Grand Canyon. Kind of an interesting kid. Uh, spent two years in junior college. He's originally from Arizona, played JUCO down there. Was drafted after two years there in the 30th round, but kept going. And then he was part of Grand Canyon's NCAA regional team last year. So hadn't had a chance to talk to him, but um, you know he comes in as a guy who started, who's had some relief uh, outings for those guys down there. And so it just kind of adds to it for Nebraska. And you talk about, we haven't really recapped the draft, but real quick, they lose Kate Povich, who was their Friday starter. They lose Cam Wynn, who was sort of their setup guy. They lose Spencer Schwellenbach, who in addition to being their shortstop was their closer. So you're talking two key bullpen arms and your Friday starter. And so they're addressing that with- And uh, Chance <laughs> Roach left. And Chance Roach, his eligibility expired. Yep. So you're talking, you're gonna have to replace two thirds of your rotation uh two of your top three bullpen arms uh and so that's what they're doing mason ornellis uh and dawson mccarville are guys who have played for successful teams played different roles and so i think this just gives them some different outs to fill roles whether that's midweek weekend uh high leverage bullpen situations things like that so that's kind of what they've been doing is restocking and then uh, obviously their entire recruiting class is coming in uh chase mason i think the freshman from south dakota could be a starter in the outfield real quick i think drew christo from elkhorn uh will play a prominent role as a pitcher pretty quickly as well well they brought him in to be the friday night starter did they not eventually maybe this year i mean he's he's not there to throw bp eventually he, very well he could I'm, be now i'm pressing you now eventually why why can't he just be the guy right away mental I mean, no, he's got stuff, right? no, mentally, he's got great makeup. No. He very well could. I'm just saying, I'm not going to assume any freshman is going to come in and be the Friday guy. Kumar um, Rocker was. Yeah, and, and he very well could. He very well could. You know, you again, this, these are the kind of things I do to you, and I'm sorry. You're good. You don't think he's as good as Kumar Rocker? Drew Christo? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he could eventually be pretty darn good. I don't think today I would say a high school grad coming in as a freshman is as good as a top 10 MLB pick. No. I'm talking about Kumar Rocker two years ago when they won the national title and he was a freshman. Maybe. I and was I, don't know, man. I think better than he was this year. Because yeah. that can happen sometimes. Or lighter. I mean lighter was a freshman last year, right? But he barely played, so he's effectively a freshman this year. Well, he was drafted this year, so he would have been in the program. All right, so he was a yeah, he was a rookie. He was he was a freshman in 2019 as well. Yeah, right. So I'm just I, I guess I'm just asking like because again, sometimes we can. This is a guy who, if he had wanted to go to the major leagues, and that was a desire of his, where would he have been drafted? Probably rounds five to ten. Okay. So, you know, isn't the expectation level for him? I mean, we're about to talk about basketball, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about Bryce McGowan's. Tell me Drew Christo isn't Bryce McGowan's as a pitcher. Is he not that because he's from Elkhorn? (laughs) No, I mean, again, but but to to flip that to the basketball side, are are you expecting Bryce McGowan's to come in and – you know, be a lottery pick right away. Like I, I just actually, I'm not, but I can tell you that the expectations for Bryce McGowan's are off the charts. Sure. Whereas I, I just find these kinds of conversations interesting. This, this is just me. Mm-hmm. Like 
what was Drew, I mean, Drew Christo's one of the top 50 prospects in the country in baseball, right? 30? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 50 to 70, somewhere in there. So we're talking about a guy that, you know, okay, Bryce McGowan's is 21st or 19th, depending on what service you look at, but we're talking about, we're talking about the functional equivalent of what, Wandale Robinson here. This is a big, this is a big, big, big time player. Yes. Okay. And so it was a huge deal that, that they, that they got him and he didn't go to the major leagues. Correct. Okay. Yes. I just, and we're also talking about a 4.0 student who was a, what, the valedictorian at a school, uh, what, 30, 35 on his ACT, I don't know. Um, we're talking about the, the, the top of the top. Mm-hmm. Son, He's of, got son, of, son of the count of Monte Cristo. Yeah. Like, He's got the intangibles. Yeah, okay. yeah. We're talking about, we're talking about a guy that has like the off the field resume of Trev Alberts and the on the field resume of someone who had a better resume than Trev Alberts had in high school playing football. Sure. <laughs> okay. I just and, just, and just, yeah, I mean, real quick, that, that, that class and, and Christo in particular, they're going to have a major part of next year. Yeah. And as an exciting, you know, Nebraska is going to be probably the favorite in the big 10, but they're going to be that despite probably starting entirely over in the outfield, despite mm-hmm. starting two thirds, uh, replacing two thirds of the rotation, despite losing the big 10 player of the year in Spencer Schwellenbach. So like, I'm fascinated because it's, it will be so much different. There's going to be a lot of faith in Will Bolton and his staff, and I think they right. that. But just objectively looking at what they have to replace, you have to make a lot of assumptions sure. that guys are going to develop and that these new guys will step in. So that's what makes next year really right. fascinating. It does. I, I guess as I've thought more about Drew, I've thought this is an Eric Strickland, Alex Gordon level athlete. Mm-hmm. Like that's the way that I think is an appropriate way to view him and it's notable to me that that he isn't really viewed that way and maybe it's because he's a pitcher and not an outfielder but we're talking about a three sports star who was a truly a star in all those sports you know a strickland level calum not nobody's quite eric strickland right he's probably the best pure athlete that the state has produced in a long time since Bob Gibson or something. I don't know. I, I'm higher on Strickland than maybe some other people are, but um, you know, but Drew Christo is in that is in that class of of guys. Like I remember when Logan Ehlers was going to come here years ago. You remember that, right? And the hyperventilating over Logan Ehlers was such that it was, you know, off the charts. And I, I you know, Christo's size and mental makeup just seems better. I don't know. We'll move on. Yeah. Basketball. Basketball's had a couple of uh, media events uh, last week. It was Trey and Bryce McGowan's, Lat Mayan. I uh, can't remember the others. Um, not trying to be rude there. Uh, this week it was Derek Walker, Kobe Webster, um, Q McPherson. Uh, Karan McPherson is his name, but Q is what he goes by. Um, Alonzo Verge, interesting player and Keon Edwards and Eduardo Andre. And uh, really appreciate Hoiberg uh, making those guys available. That's, I really appreciate that. It's good for him to do that. They're getting, they're getting their stories out there. I got a call. I'm the sports editor now at the World Herald. I can't get over that. But I got a call from a Creighton fan asking me where the coverage is for the Jays. And for what a word, we've had a ton of coverage about Creighton basketball this summer with Colt Brenner and – and, and, you know, Marcus Zagorowski might get drafted tomorrow night. We'll obviously be covering the heck out of that. We've had a lot of coverage of Creighton signing all the recruits. But I'm like, well, you know, Nebraska made all of its players available to the media. <laughs> so, and it was their idea. What did, what did you learn? Like we talk about not that how there's not a ton to learn in this fall camp for football. What, do you, what did you learn from these last two weeks? About well, that? you have to try to get a vibe. And we're going to be adding a beat writer who we'll introduce in the podcast next week. We'll be taking over basketball full time and will love this way more um, than I ever could, although I've loved covering it and I'll continue to, you know, drop in here and there. Um, but uh, what did we learn? Well, what you try to do is listen in between the raindrops, right? You try to listen for the things that seem a little off script. And the things that I hear that are off script is they've got better shooting. They've got um, 
still some communication issues to iron out because they're very young and they have a lot of young players and talent isn't the issue it's doing all the little things and being a good team and working with chemistry that's what i'm hearing and the shooting piece is important because they need to be a good shooting team if they're going to fulfill fred hoiberg's vision what i hear from these guys is cj welcher has been added to the team he can shoot keon edwards is a pretty good shooter bryce mcgallan's the five star uh, appears to be a very good shooter and i think that's extremely important for him um boy it would help if he was a 40 percent three-point shooter it'd open everything else up we already know kobe's around 40 percent. kobe webster lat man was 35 I, I think they think he can be better than that but for much of last year lat was the only three-point shooter they had so you know they had to do the best they could um i think i hear that i think i hear the team is still young and it is you look at all the guys they got, Evan, they're as young and as talented as they've ever been. But they got a core group, Lat Mayan, Trey McGowan's, Kobe Webster, Derek Walker, those four. All four could start. I don't think all four will, but all four could. And then after that, they've got Trevor Lakes, who's sort of a shooter. And after that, everything is, is really, really brand new, um, whether it's a Juco edition, whether it's, um, you know, Kaisei Tamanaga, who just finished his um you know three on three stint for the japanese olympic basketball team um so there was that uh, or or it's just you know transfers or freshmen and it's it's a fascinating team and it's it's full of guys that i think are are, are all kind of hoiberg guys you know um they all can talk pretty well like they're they're all pretty good interviews there's there isn't a there isn't a you know a sheepish an overly sheepish one in the bunch and, you know, that just kind of shrugs and goes, I don't really know what to think. <laughs> like, none of them were like that. And I think when, when Hoiberg and Matt have the messy recruit, they're recruiting for personality, too. And, and so I think they're, they're all wearing these we over me shirts, which I think is probably encapsulates their, their thought process. That's recruiting, what I'm recruiting for personality. I've, I've never heard it maybe put that way. Like, is that are you saying like the recruiting to, to fit whatever their culture is for their program or? is a certain outgoing personality an important part of what they're looking for? I would describe it more as, you know, they're recruiting for, um, what's the right word? Vocal and tough. Those are two qualities that I think good basketball teams have. They, they can talk, they talk a lot on the court. I've learned that communication on a court, I've just learned this talking to college basketball coaches over the last several years is something that's gone down, down a little bit, but it's also so crucial. And you know how a football team talks before the snap, you have to, cause you're getting the play call and all that. But, but in basketball, a team that goes quiet is a team that's probably not playing the best defense it can. And so communication on that side, I think they want to recruit that. Um, and then they want to be able to recruit skill. I mean, they, they want good shooters. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's important to them. And mm -hmm. I think they're always going to be, I, I, I would be surprised if, if a Fred Hoiberg team is the best rebounding team in the big 10 at any given time in his tenure, I doubt they will be the number one team in rebounding margin. Um, sometimes when you shoot a lot of threes, I mean, you're five out and you're spaced, you may give up a few rebounds. Uh, but I think they want to get better there. And, and, uh, but but the pieces that I think are really important is they want to get a little bit better shooting. And I think they want to get better quickness. And I think with Verge, they got the quickness with Wilcher. They got the shooting. I think with Keon Edwards, maybe they get a little bit of both with Bryce McGowan's. They get both. Ideally Bryce McGowan's is a guy that can hit the three. And then once he's done that to you and stuck a few in your face, um, okay, I'm going to come out and get you and, and, and try to close out on you. And he's by you. And he's going in for, you know, a, a jam or he's going in, he's going, in, he's drawing defenders to him and he's slipping it off to a Eduardo Andre, that kind of thing. So McGowan's the one thing that I heard from a couple different guys is he's a three level scorer and that's the hitting the three. Um, okay. Somebody stops you at 12 feet from the hoop. Can you hit a shot if you have to, or can you, you know, adjust 
Baylor was great at that. Gosh, you watched Baylor last year. They were unbelievable from 12 feet. Um, and then ideally you get to the rim and you're, you're just pounding, pounding it with two hand dunks and layups and all that. So, and, and he can also, and hopefully he can score from the free throw line. Can he, can he, okay. He gets fouled. Can he make 75% of his free throws? So those are the things that I think they hope for him. Um, I don't think he's, I don't think he has to be a lottery pick in his first year. I don't think he'd, he'd be opposed to it. No one would, including Nebraska. So if he goes in there and he averages 15 points, six rebounds and three assists, he's probably not sticking around for mm. year two. <laughs> just feels like, you know, from, from what I follow the team, it seems like they're just more relaxed and kind of comfortable with who they are than they've been under Fred. I know a lot of the, that, a lot of that's had to do with roster turnover and obviously the pandemic last year, but it just, and maybe you can speak to this, but it just feels like, they, they kind of know what they are a little bit more, even though a lot of them are new, they know um, kind of what's being asked of them. And, and, and maybe they're just more comfortable with the task at hand than the last handful of Nebraska teams have been. I think they have pretty good leadership, Evan. Um, I think Trey McGowan's is a, is a very, uh, he can be an emotional guy, but I think he's a dedicated leader and he wants to see his brother have a great experience. Kobe Webster is an academic all American. So Everything that goes with that is what you see on the court. You know, he's smart. He's, he's controlled. He's all the things that make a good student, you know? So he, he, he's a guy that's bringing them along. I think Derek Walker is all heart, you know, and he's a good leader too. You can tell he, he's got a lot. He wears his heart on his sleeve, but is pragmatic enough to know that sometimes when he said something five times, he needs somebody else to say it. And then, you know, Lat is a, Lat is a fascinating person and, and I, I want to get to know more about him and his his experiences but the guy works really hard and he leads by example and and uh he loved you know you could see it when he would kick a chair last year coming off the court and it wasn't in a pouty way it was in a he was mad at himself kind of way um you can see how much he cares about it and they wanted him back I think partially because of that the big question and this isn't something that needs to be answered today because goodness gracious there's three months before the season begins um, is how they're going to figure out of all the other guys, who's going to get the minutes and how long you take the minutes battle into the season before you kind of kick over and say, okay, it's got to be these nine guys. We have 14. Some guys are not going to play. Um, and I do think at times, Evan, th there was some issues with that last year where um, they played a lot of guys. And then I think toward the end of the year, you saw them kind of say, all right, we're going to play Eduardo Moore and Ivan less. And that's why Ivan left. Uh, we're not going to play Shamil as much. He makes too many turnovers. He gets into the middle of the lane and he runs someone over. So we're going to play him less. Um, Delano Banton isn't going to play as much. We he doesn't make shots or I, I don't know. Banton's a, he's not back. So we don't need to revisit it and it doesn't matter, but that was a unique experience for them. Uh, Teddy, you know, you have to, you have to change and accept your role. You're not going to, okay, goodbye. Like they finally got to that point last year, but it took a while because of COVID. I think this year they're going to get to that point a lot faster and just say, all right, here's who we're going to be until further notice or until you earn your playing time, but we're not just going to put you on the court. Um, to say, hey, you know, you got your five minutes too. Uh, it's not going to be, um, what do you want to call it? It's not going to be uh, all equal. Like, and they've got players on the team that I think are pretty dang good who may not get a lot of minutes. And they have to, they have to just accept that and understand that this team may look very different next year and they may get those minutes next season. Hmm. That'll be fascinating to see. It's, New group, big personality, which is a lot different than we've seen from Nebraska basketball. I mean, it, it just feels like a lot of guys, especially oh, under yeah. Tim Miles, have been quieter, more uh, introverted, whatever you want to call it. So it would be refreshing, I think, to see a group that's excited to kind of put its stuff out there and, and give some thoughts along the way, too. And major credit again to Hoiberg for putting those guys with us and getting them used to that um, because 
if this team goes where they want to go, they're going to be talking a lot. They're going to, they're going to be, they're going to be, you know, a big story around here because people are hungry for success in that program. And, you know, Bryce handles himself really well. He's obviously has a podcast. And so this isn't really about Bryce, Bryce, Bryce handles himself like a, a person who has been around the country and, and, and he just has a certain more mature aura about him. So it's not really about him. It's, it's about some of these other guys that, you know, maybe have only talked to the media maybe once or twice and they're pretty good. I mean, they handled it. I thought quite well. So, you know, kudos to them. And again, we, you know, we love opportunities to talk to players as much as we can. And Nebraska's done a good job of making them available. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Camp starts tomorrow or this week. One player you're looking for, one player that you're in, you're most intrigued to see how they do. Just one. Mm. Gabe Irvin. I want to see how Gabe Irvin does. He's a guy, a freshman, who I don't think was asked to do everything that he could do in high school coming out of a powerhouse program in Georgia. Um, I know they, they feel like Marquis Stepp maybe could be that guy if he's healthy, but Irvin, to me, seems like the most well-rounded. I'm excited to see what he can do this fall. Save your bets. He's as talented as they come. We'll find out if it's, it's ready to all click together, because if it is, they, they got, you know, as Deontay Williams said, one of the best receivers in the Big Ten. That's what he said about him. He could be one of the best receivers in the Big Ten. When's hmm. the last time Nebraska could say that about one of its receivers? Six years ago when they had Kenny Bell, wouldn't it be nice to have a guy like that for Adrian Martinez? We'll see. Mm -hmm. All right, that is the end of the Big Six podcast. We will be back next week, and we will be back every week after that. Um, I'm Sam McEwen along with Evan Bland. We'll see you next week after camp has begun. Thank you.